Hello, folks, and welcome back to podcast number 40 here at danjohnuniversity.com. Thanks for joining up. Before I begin answering questions, just one small thing I want to remind people about. I have a podcast on the YouTube account, and it's available at danjohnuniversity.com. And it's a real simple talk called Don't Be Binary. It, it might be just an issue with me, but it's something that really bothers me. I don't like questions where the answer is either or. Um, I don't think it's a high level of rigor for one thing. And very often, it's just not a good answer. Um, there's a lot of factors to talk about. Currently, I'm working with a young man, Jeff Hemingway, who's 42 and he wants to learn the Olympic lifts. Well, um, he's a kettlebell instructor, a kettlebell team leader. He's very good. He wants to really expand his game. But I have to coach a 42-year-old in the Olympic lifts differently than I might coach a 14-year-old. It's just the realities of life and, well, you know, uh, the, the, the rigors of being 42 versus the uh, promise of 14. So if you can, try to keep an eye on your questions about being binary, asking me a yes, no, either or question. And the second thing I worry about is if you're asking me for any kind of medical intervention question, these come up a lot, and I'm just never comfortable with them. Not because I, I might give you bad advice, but because the person ans asking the question might get good advice, but someone hearing the question with another set of situations might take what I'm saying wrong and, I don't know, maybe hurt themselves or worse, hurt somebody else. Well, let's get started. We got a question from a young man by the name of John, spelled J-O-N. We need to talk about that after. What is a good standard for general fitness in the Olympic lifts? Okay, just so you know, folks, that's an easy question for me to answer. I'm going to answer it right now. Uh, John is a male, so for males, uh, and I'm going to include the old clean and press here uh, that was the Olympic lifts lost in 1972, which is a while ago now. I think you should be able to clean and press and snatch your body weight. And then you should clean and jerk about 20 pounds, 10 kilos over your body weight. Those two standards really have stood up for a long time. And interesting, I, I'm the longer and longer I'm around, the more I agree with the great Soviet lifter, uh, Vasily Alexiev, um, that your, clean, your back squat should really be only about 10 kilos, 20 pounds more than your clean and jerk. So let me give you quick standards. Clean and press and snatch body weight. Clean and jerk 10 kilos, 20-ish pounds more. Squat. 10 kilos, 20-ish pounds more than your clean and jerk. That's a nice set of standards. Um, I worked with an athlete by the name of Glenn Passy years ago who thought that was the only standard you ever had to worry about. Okay, but there's more to this question. Is some percentage of body weight the best way to come up with a goal? Yes, as I just said. Now, you can certainly break it down to three quarters and half and that kind of thing, and that's fine. But you'll notice... Oh boy, it takes me back. It does. The very first Strength and Health magazine I ever read, I must have been about 10 or so, and it was an article about wrestling. And the author said that if you know you can snatch your opponent overhead, that gives you a lot of confidence in the ring. And I remember thinking that and thinking, yeah, if you can throw somebody over your head, you probably can do pretty good against them. So you can certainly break these numbers down to less, but the real changes happen when you get around body weight. We discovered the same thing with the clean, the clean with the high school athlete. Uh, high school athletes don't really clean the weight at first. They kind of do a dead lefty, jumpy reverse curl. But to get over 200, they have to, you know, they have to hinge and whip and really, really explosively get under the bar. And it usually happened at about 200 pounds which we came up with the standard of 205 in the clean for boys. Uh, and that really did seem to help a lot of them. For female high school athletes, it's 95. But there's more. Also, do you have a good strategy for getting my first pull-up? My first pull-up. Now, if you want to snatch and clean and jerk, you should be able to do a pull-up. But he adds something here. I'm 240 pounds. It's not muscle, which I know doesn't help. But I'd like to really be able to do just one. So... For him to get up to a body weight snatch, 240, that's a much different uh, journey than I did. The first time I ever 
did a snatch. I was with Pete Hoffman at the Pacifica Barbell Club. He, I had met him at the meet on Saturday. Dick Notmeyer was our coach, and Dick showed me how to snatch. I weighed 162, and Pete and I went up, and I think I snatched body weight. If it wasn't the first workout, it was within two or three. At my first weightlifting meet, I got up to about 100, and I think I weighed about 180 pounds by then. I'd put on weight really fast in those first couple of weeks, and I snatched 187. Within nine months, I snatched 231, and the following year, I was about 264. So if you're weighing 240, there's a good chance you're not going to do that in the first three days. 110 10 kilo snatch is a good snatch. So for you, I want you to think about, John, reasonable snatch and clean and jerk lifts. And I would use the general, you know, we usually call it the natural lifts. If you're using pounds, that's um, 135 pound snatch, 185 pound snatch, 205 pound snatch, you know, the, the big weights put on. Um, that'd be 60, 60, 70, 80, 90 kilos. But on the pull up, I, I'm gonna give you, John, the same strategy I give everyone. I would suggest hanging at first. If you join Dan John University, there's a program there called the post post deployment program. And I go through a three month thing that I use with them, with my military guys. I don't want them to do a lot of pull-ups. They can all pull up. Uh, our test is to hang for 30 seconds and then do one pull-up, hang for 30 seconds, do two, hang for 30 seconds, do three, hang for 30 seconds, and then do four. Uh, I would suggest following the hang, hang, and hang program to build up both ends of the pull-up. And that'll probably do a lot of good for you with so little damage to the elbows. Uh, the, the word we always use is MAPS, middle-aged pull, middle pull-up syndrome. At a certain age, missing a pull-up does all kinds of damage to the elbows. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners are going, yeah, I know what you mean, I know what you mean. And the only way to get over that is rest. And then if you fail or do something stupid in the pull-up, uh, two years from now, it comes right back. Kind of like a like a tennis elbow. We used to hear that when I was young, something I haven't heard in a long time. But it's the same ballpark of issues. We have a question from Donna, and I know Donna. Donna says, my husband, Scott, you worked together at Juan Diego during your meat in a bag phase. Uh, Donna, the reason I put meat in a bag was so that I could have meat at school, and I still do that when I travel. So it's not a phase, it's what I do. And I have this ongoing disagreement regarding late night meals, or for that matter, what is the best time to your meals? How many meals per day? What constitutes a meal? Well, I mean, this is this is a, a, a and this is a classic. Boy, does it depend. Uh, one of the books I, I, I really enjoy a lot is called Two Meals a Day. And I'm starting to think after a certain age, uh, you probably are probably wiser to move to two meals a day. I, I'm not saying breakfast is bad. I'm not saying lunch is good. I'm not saying dinner is bad. Um, you, you really need to get your macronutrients in. You need to avoid sugar and crap food. Uh, if you're concerned, and, you know, including desserts and crappy snacks, let's not even talk anymore. Um, late night meals can actually work. Uh, like for example, those people who do the warrior diet, where you basically eat all your cal cal calories in a four hour window, you'll note that if you get home from work at five, and you cook those, you saute those original vegetables right away, your window of eating, uh, some five thirty or six, is going to take you all the way to ten. Um, <laughs> Do calories at night make you fat because you sleep right after? Well, no. But what happens is, well, if the bathtub mo model is correct, uh, that's the calories in, that's the faucet, and the calories out is the drain. And if you want to maintain equilibrium, uh, your your set, your body set weight, uh, you got to have those two equal. Now, we know because of hormones and puberty and all kinds of diseases and stuff that that's not always true. So late night can be an issue with some people because if you're eating foods that cause an insulin surge, like, you know, the sugar family and things like that, yeah, it can be a problem at night. Having said that, if, if you eat at 10 o'clock and your meal is, a, a, you know, 16 different vegetables and a very small amount of protein and I don't know, some salmon or something like that, 
Uh, you're going to have a hard, your body's going to have to work overtime trying to turn that into blubber. Um, what is the best time to your meals? Uh, again, that's an it depends. I'm a big believer that it, I'm a big believer that a lot of people uh, make good progress by doing intermittent fasting. And the reason I like that so much, Donna, is because intermittent fasting teaches you that you're hungry, not starving. That you're hungry and that's a controllable urge. Um, uh, sadly, I think in America, many people have lost the ability to control their controllable urge of, of hungry. Very often on watching TV and people are shouting at the camera about different things, um, they got their mouths wide open as they shout. And that's the issue they have at the table. They keep their mouths wide open way too often as they shovel things down. How many meals a day? Well, you know, the bodybuilders back 20 years ago, they believed that you should eat six meals a day, of which every one of them was something I would never do. I had a friend who did small amount of chicken breast, broccoli, and rice. And I always thought the white rice was, you know, the way your body perceives white rice is about the same way it perceives sugar. It never made sense to me. Uh, for me, when you ask this last question, what constitutes a meal? For me, it would be something that has a, a protein, a vegetable, and you sit down like an adult. Um, these are all good questions, um, but it seems to be that when you look at the, the, the questions here, late night meals, best time for your meals, how many meals a day, what constitutes a meal? Um, I mean, I think, I think if you stand back, these are all questions that have, you know, pretty simple, pretty reasonable answers. I mean, if you're going to argue that, uh, you know, a, if I'm walking around the house with a chicken breast eating a bag full of vegetables, that's a snack. Whereas if I sat down at the table, we would call that a meal. I don't, I don't like that. Uh, this, we almost start to slide over into an either or situation. Um, I would say, uh, what, since the two of you are having an ongoing disagreement, uh, I think you should both sit down and agree to disagree and make sure you enjoy quality meals together as a family. Thank you. Christoph asks us a question. What are your thoughts on training to failure versus staying fresh or keeping one or two reps in the tank? Well, there was a time in my life where I thought you should always train to failure. And what that teaches is training to failure. Um, I'm a big believer Marty Gallagher would agree with me. Most of the great strength coaches I've had a chance to know in my life would, would agree that you always want to keep one or two in the tank. Ed Cohen, the great power lifter, Marty's told me stories about him. If the program said a set of three and he knew he could do a set of five, six, or seven, he would do the three. And I think that's a secret to greatness. Uh, a buddy of mine was walking uh, in Bulgaria one time and it was like one of those weird stories where he heard that specific noise of weights crashing. Same thing happened, by the way, with another guy in China. And he was invited to go in to watch the Bulgarian weightlifting team. And he had a chance over a couple week periods to observe the Bulgarian national team train a, a number of times. One of the interesting things about it was this. He, they never miss in training. They never miss in training. And I thought that was just amazing. Um, it made me start thinking about the great programs I've done, uh, the transformation program, the one lift a day, easy strength. And the common thing about all those programs is these are programs that are based on never missing. And then I look back on those times in my career and I realized I threw the disc as far because I wasn't burning up my nervous system all the time. Is going to failure necessary to get some muscle? Now that's a question I don't know if I can answer. Uh, many bodybuilders when I was younger were really into the idea of you'd go to failure and then your buddy would help you force reps. And that's good, except what I noticed in gyms, the guys who did that often didn't look. They, they looked, uh, <laughs> I hate to say, it. they looked like they lifted weights, but they looked kind of stringy. Where you go and walk and you look at the power lifter and, lift, and Olympic lifters and they all looked a lot buffer. Uh, so it's a tough question. I don't know. I've In 2020, I don't think you go to failure. Other parts of my career, I would say, oh, yeah, man, right on. You know, go for the burn, you know, but now I'm not so sure. 
or is it sufficient to push it every once in a while and trying to keep progressing in weights over the over the midterm, over the long term? I think that's what you want to do. I practice something called progressive resistance exercise, P-R-E. And my idea is to always progress, not only in load, which is the easy one, but in uh, sets and reps as appropriate, uh, the complexity of the movement, or progress uh, something as simple as from the overhead press to the bench press to the incline press to the decline press, from the barbell to the kettlebell to whatever. So for me, yeah, I think you should always progress and, and keep it a rep or two in the tank. And how is it even safe to go to technical fair when doing squats, kettlebell presses, let alone the bench? I don't know who, you, I'm almost wondering, is this, this to me is a rhetorical question, which are always, my students uh, in my college class ask rhetorical questions all the time, and I never know how to ask one. But no, it's not safe. When I was in junior college, a guy in San Francisco died bench pressing in front of his five-year-old son. Uh, he had collars on the bar. My good friend Dan Martin just told me a terrible story that happened in California about a man who put his GoPro up and did a heavy bench press by himself and alone. And the video of his death, he, the, the, poor, the, the police officer had to watch the video of his death. I mean, that's some tough stuff. So no, I don't believe in that at all. So for me... Get a program, follow the program. Even if you're like, you know, what Mike Warren Brown and I do, um, sometimes we'll do, okay, we're gonna do eight, five, three on this exercise. And we, at the end, we'll say to each other, that was too light, that was too, you know, the, the goal, I call it Goldilocks, okay? Too hot, too cold, just right. Too soft, too hard, just right. And what we're trying to always do is get to the Goldilocks thing of looking for just right. Um, get yourself away from, too hard, too easy. And keep searching, Christoph, for just right. Okay, folks, Zachary asked a question that I, I'm surprised it took this long for me to get. Tom Brady, in a recent interview with Howard Stern, Howard Stern, the, the fitness professional, that was a joke, said that lifting heavy can make your muscles less functional because it tightens them up and makes joints behave unnaturally, which leads to injury. He believes in band work, as I'm sure you know. Yeah, I was one of the first people to buy his book, TB12, and I read it on a plane on the, on the way to a workshop uh, for Perform Better. This seems to go against all strength and conditioning philosophy. Can you discuss this idea of his? Um, I like the book a lot. I, th I learned a lot from it. This thing called plasticity, that was pretty good. The band thing, I use bands. Um... What we have with Tom Brady is an N equals one situation. He is an amazing young man. He went to Sarah High School, which a number of my, that's where I'm from South City, so a number of my classmates went there too. Sarah High School has an interesting uh, Hall of Fame. Lynn Swan, the great USC quarterback who became a wide receiver for the Steelers, four Super Bowls. Um, Barry Bonds, who has the, who's the home run king. And Tom Brady all went to that one high school. Uh, that's a pretty good Hall of Fame, including my classmate John Caselli was, is in their Hall of Fame. <sighs> does, does doing bands work? Well, if you follow his nutritional advice, which is solid, his recovery advice, which I think is, was very good, especially in the areas of sleep, um, and you do the band work he recommends, I think you'll be just fine. How far are you going to throw the discus? Not very. How far are you going to throw the shot? Not very. Um, are you going to be impressive when you walk up and down the beach? Maybe not. There is great value in band work. I like bands. Uh, we, um, Kevin Mass and I, we do this one little thing with bands that we really are enjoying. I keep trying to expand my band work uh, repertoire because, well, especially now with the coronavirus, but even for travel, having a good set of bands is wonderful to train with. Um, I like the ones that have handles on the end for travel, so I can do front squats and I can do presses, which I believe if you did, if you do front squats and presses on a road trip, you're doing okay. But, you know, Zachary, I just don't know. You know, uh, it'd be interesting to see another person um, 
have that kind of success doing the band work. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you're going to ever get anybody in that many Super Bowls, but his, his training, his discipline, his training ethic, it's, it's on another plateau. So with Tom Brady, I really follow what he does, and I play close attention. But as we sometimes say, I just stay out of my, don't play in my ballpark. Uh, he can say anything he wants about, I will listen to him when he talks about winning games in the, in the final period. When he talks about longevity, I'll listen. When it comes to strength and conditioning, uh, he's an N equals one. Uh, the bulk of us won't. Uh, if you think doing bands is going to get you to six Super Bowl MVPs or whatever it is, uh, good luck on that, okay? Um, I'd like to see more people try it and get more research. I don't know of anybody in track and field doing it, though I can imagine maybe some distance runners would really get a lot out of it, especially that ability to, to take care of what we call the column, the area between the knees and the neck, that whole core idea. Sorry, Zachary, I, I don't know what else to say on this. Thank you. Jim asks, do you, use, do you use any testosterone boosters like Alpha Male? Why? Yeah, I used to because I used to get a box of them every month. And I was going through a time in my life uh, where I was working two full-time jobs, uh, training at a high level, had two daughters, uh, my wife on the road a lot. And I was concerned that I was kind of breaking apart inside. Do T-boosters work? Well... I still think that vitamin D, uh, going outside in the sunshine, taking care of recovery, uh, sleep especially, some kind of, uh, what do they call it? They used to call it autogenic feedback, which we now call meditation. Uh, I take saunas. I take uh, Epsom salt baths. Uh, I don't know if they work at all. Um, but if you're not, if you want your T levels to say hi, um, Sunshine, recovery, uh, lounging around, intense training are all probably better than, uh, than a pill over the counter. Having said that, if it's something that you'd want to try, uh, I have no issues with this. I think, in fact, this is a good idea. Um, wean yourself off of all your supplements for, and at, you'd probably need two or three weeks, all of them. And then train normally and add the booster. And try to see, for me, I would use something like I have a program called the Transformation Program. I know exactly what's coming up. Um, three days a week, you do overhead squats, front squats. Uh, one day, three sets of eight, one minute rest, harder than it looks. One day, you do a press and a power curl, which is a curl grip power clean. Three by eight, one minute rest. The other day is whip snatches. That's a high hang snatch and clean grip snatch. Three sets of eight, one minute rest. And you do a little bit of ab work behind that. Uh, and maybe one day a week, you'd run like hills. And then one day a week, go for something long, a long bike ride, a long walk or something like that. When I say long, it'd be over an hour, whatever over an hour means. If it's a hike, it could be six hours. If it's a bike ride, easily three Um do a program like that, uh, stick with it, uh, I was going to say religiously, but stick with it, and basically a program you've done before, so you know what the benefits are going to be from it, and then after about a six-week period, just kind of stop and say, okay, let's assess. You could use before and after pictures, uh, measurements if you get, get good ones. Measurements are always so tough. Uh, there are people probably nodding along here and other people going, measurements are the simplest thing. Um, all you got to do is ask where the waistline is and you'll get a thousand answers. Um, before and after pictures can be excellent. Uh, if you can do some kind of screen like a DEXA, that's even better. Um, I also use those vague ones like quality of sleep, uh, which is a little, there are sometimes kind of hard to get your hand on. Um, uh, and just get a sense of things. Uh, if you're male, something might pop up in the morning. I'll give you an indicator whether your testosterone levels are high or low. Uh, for females, you might notice other things uh, that probably aren't appropriate for me to discuss. So, yeah, I, Jim, I think there's a value to them. But this is going to have to be an experiment of Jim, okay? And uh, 
If you don't mind, if you find a brand that you think is really good um, and, and you notice changes, would you mind sharing it with me? And I, I'll, I'll look into it myself. I have to be a little careful at my age because, you know, you, you got to be careful about, you know, messing with your uh, hormonal system uh, at a certain age because of the issues with maybe in, encouraging a cancer or something like that, which happens a lot more than you would think, sadly. Jim, that's a good question. It was short, but I liked it. Thank you so much. Aiden asks... What is your recommended weekly activity for both young and old? Boy, I'm just going to fall back on what uh, Pat Flynn says that I like. Two or three times a week, get stronger. Two or three times a week, get sweaty. I like that. Um, some mix of weightlifting and long walks, long bicycles, uh, maybe an occasional really, really hard workout. So let's let's break. Okay, let's separate the two. We're going to do a couple uh, layers here then, okay? So two or three times a week, get strong. Two or three times a week, get sweaty, okay? Can you do uh, strong, sweaty on the same day? Absolutely anything you want to do. Can you separate them out? Absolutely anything you want to do. Level two. Um, I, I would recommend keeping medium most of the time for most people. Since you said young and old, you know, uh, Reasonable workouts most of the time. Occasionally, go much longer. So maybe, uh, you know, I, I don't know what your situation here you're asking, but, you know, I can remember, <laughs> I think it was Marty McVeigh. No, no, check that. Micah Reagan, John Caselli and I went for a bike ride one time in South City on our Stingrays, and we decided to ride, to ride down to the airport, which is amazing to think you could do it back at the time because his mom worked at the USO place and we could get free donuts. So we probably rode our bikes for five or six hours for some free donuts. And I remember going up a hill at the end of it. And if you've ever rode a Stingray, you had to go like this up a hill. And my quads were on fire. Um, generally, I rode the bike to go see my friends, say about half an hour to an hour. That day was six. Occasionally have that long walk, hike, bike ride. Occasionally have that hyper intensive workout. Uh, that's the one where you just go after it. Something really difficult, short and hard, bye-bye. Mostly medium, sometimes longer, sometimes short and intense. Two to three days a week get sweaty, two to three days a week get stronger with those other variations on top, Aiden. And I don't care what your age is, that's a good formula. Oh, and have some fun. Tina, I don't know if you've ever seen the freshman uh, Tina, but uh, the lovely Tina. Uh, I want to do the 10,000 swing challenge again. Well, good for you. It's, I don't think I ever will again. But I only have a 16 kettlebell bell, and that's pretty easy for me at this point. That's impressive, Tina. How do I make the challenge harder with the 16? Do I go faster, add exercises, or do something else? You know, for a while, Tina, we've been discussing... And the hard thing about this is for me to actually push it forward, I'd actually have to do it myself. The 10,000 snatch challenge. And I say that out loud. The problem with the snatch is that the, so the swing uh, has a window of boom, 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 boom. Well, the snatch has a much longer stroke to it. Um, if you would like to try this, I, I can't, I can't in good conscience tell you to do a 10,000 snatch uh, program, but it would be interesting to do maybe the, yeah, I was thinking about 200 snatches a day on this. So you'd break it up 10, 10, you know, 10 left, 10 right, something like that, however you break it up. Um, so you're doing 100 snatches left and 100 snatches right. That's 200, by the way, so, and here's the thing, Tina. I'm still working this through. I'm in a conversation with somebody who's also thinking the same thing. And we're working on a number. So that's 200 a day. If you multiply that by 20, which to me is about the length of a challenge, 20 times 200 is 4,000. I'm telling you from the truth. What's the problem with this program, Tina? The 4,000 snatch challenge just doesn't have, it just doesn't sound as sexy. 
Now, you, some hand goes up. Yes. Make it the 5,000. Okay. The 5,000 snatch down. Do it for 25 days. And I'm fine with that, too. Uh, that'll move it into a five-week challenge, uh, five days a week. Uh, the skin on your hands are going to be rough, but there's an idea for you. <clears throat> As a female, and I, I think you're a female if you're named Tina. If I'm wrong, I apologize. Uh, snatching the 16 for 100 left and right every day for 25 days uh, is going to make, is going to, if you don't make progress doing that, you you call me and we'll figure out, we'll, we'll figure out something, uh, well, something else for you. The one thing I wouldn't do is what you said here, uh, do I go faster? Um, you know, I there comes a point in the 10,000 swing challenge where it's obvious you're done with it. You know, I'll get emails. I don't know what the big deal is. I did, I did uh, the 500 swings in 20 minutes. I'm like, your swing isn't a swing. You're not, you're truly not hitting it on both ends. The hinge plank, hinge plank. So going faster with crappy reps is just more, not better. I hope that helped. Taylor asked a question. When I first read it, it kind of made me angry. So Taylor, don't get this wrong, okay? Reading all of Longo's longevity diet leaves a few disparities between his general nutrition advice and yours. Why is that a problem? Oh, I got angry again. Um, Longo is talking about, in his book, Longevity. And he's talk, and, he, and it comes from uh, working with cancer patients. Um, I work with elite athletes who are trying to perform at a higher level. That's, that's one difference. And don't put us both into a box. You just gave us an either or here. It's okay that there's changes. It's okay there's disparities. Chiefly, he recommends quite low protein intake for longevity. And longevity is four of one of four pillars I talk about. Health, I use Maffetone's definition, the optimum interplay of the human organs. As we speak right now uh, from this chair in my office, I'm healthy because my doctors have all said I am. We might have missed something, we don't know. But uh, at, at this moment, I don't have any skin cancers. My teeth are in good shape. My eyes are good. My blood tests uh, are bringing no, no problems back. Fitness, ability to do a task. Um, because of some issues, I'm throwing the javelin far again, uh, not the discus so much. So I'm fit to throw the discus. Uh, longevity is quality and quantity. Uh, I've, I've mentioned more than honestly a few times, Taylor, that quantity is not a factor in my family. We don't live long, but quality is what I focus on. And of course, what I do is protein. So remember, longevity is one of four pillars I talk about. And your recommendation is usually eat even more protein. That's not really, I mean, that's what I say, but it's when I work or, or even get a chance to be around normal, be around normal people with the grain the wheat, soy, uh, corn diet that most Americans eat, corn chips, potato chips. Um, when I say more protein, it's just to get them satiated and getting used to be full. Uh, I can't believe the number of people I'll say something like, well, you can have salmon. I hate fish. Oh, you can eat eggs. Oh, I don't want to make them. Uh, you could do this. Oh, I don't want to eat. They push back the laziness of some people. Um, that's So when I tell more fiber, by the way, this comes from Rob Wolf, more fiber, more protein, more fish oil, that's Rob Wolf's advice that I steal. Uh, have you questioned your protein recommendations after embracing some of the FMD uh, principles? Uh, no. Uh, I do the fast mimicking diet every other month. Oddly, I haven't done it during the... Uh, during our stay in place uh, here. And I think the reason I don't want to do the FMD, the, the prolong one week um, 500 calories a day thing is that uh, I don't know if emotionally I can handle it right now. Uh, like many of you, I'm a little bit on the edge. As you can tell by the way I'm answering this question. Uh, no. no. I love the book. I love his insights to, uh, you can get, you don't need to buy the book. Everything he has is on online. Uh, I go through the company he recommends, Prolon, P-R-O-L-O-N. Uh, his material is also in Spring Chicken right there, which is staring at me right now. But uh, yeah, I don't, uh, 
And again, how much, I, I don't, if you were to have some meals with me, Taylor, you would realize that I'm not as freakishly high in protein as you think. I am freakishly high in the number of vegetables I eat, but not the amount of protein. I hope that helped, okay? All right. Now, Brian put a footnote on this one. He's not sure if I should answer this one or not. And so I thought about whether or not I should answer it. You make fairly consistent references to God. Well, as an Irishman, the only time I can talk with my equals is when I talk to God. Braveheart. Uh, being a believer and things like that. Of what tradition are you coming out of? <laughs> coming out? It's kind of an odd. Okay, just curious. Glad to answer this question, Josh. But let me start off with a caveat first. I teach religious studies. I've also, I have a degree in religious education. Uh, I'm considered a very solid theologian, which are all three different worlds. Um, so before I even answer it, I just want to make sure you know that I've traveled around the world and have, have had amazing moments with members of just about every faith tradition, including faith traditions very few people know much about uh, the Maronites, the Druze. Uh, those are just two Middle Eastern ones. Uh, various uh, Islamic uh, smaller groups. But uh, I am a Roman Catholic. Uh, and I have a Catholic education, which means that uh, I was taught to read great books. I was taught to defend my thoughts. I was taught to argue logically and reasonably. I was, I'm expected to care for the poor. And uh, in fact, that's one of my standards uh, that uh, it's called the preferential option for the poor. And you'll notice that, uh, you know, the first thing I, when this virus hit, Brian and I both agreed that we need to lower our prices at the university so that more and more people could be on it at a cheaper rate. Uh, some of the finest people I ever met in my life are Roman Catholics. Some of the worst human beings I ever met in my life are Roman Catholics. Um, I am proud of many things about my faith and I am disgusted and disappointed with so many others. Uh, I live in Utah, so I'm a minority and, uh, there are things about my neighbors I love and there's things about my neighbors that make me shake my head. Uh, so yeah. And you say I'm a believer. That's interesting. Um, I don't know how much I would say that. Uh, it's just not a phrase I would use a lot, but, um, you know, I, I mean, I always wish I could pick on who goes to hell. Um, it's, uh, and it's something I always caution my students about and administrators sometimes, you know, uh, parents, especially the helicopter parents we have that, they, who drove me out of education, you know, they, uh, they pick a one, a 10, 15 second event from, 186 days and decide whether or not you know, you're a good person. I always tell people if there is a St. Peter's and the pearly gate or there's a judgment in any faith tradition, I always hope I get to pick my best events in my life. I hope it's not my worst enemy who gets to pick the events they, they look over. So yeah, I am, uh, that's what I believe. I think the best book to understand the way I am is Thomas Cahill's book, How the Irish Saved Civilization. Uh, I found that book in many parts to be, to explain kind of my vision of the universe. Uh, it's very difficult to be a religious person nowadays. Uh, it's like uh, the people who run churches are going out of their way to push people out the doors. And uh, I have so many stories of my church locally that just are difficult. Um, the important thing is I constantly have to remind myself that uh, <laughs> the guy, uh, the guy who we, you know, the guy, the guy who we like to think started this whole thing, hung around with uh, the poor, the ill, the injured, and told us that uh, it's how we treat the dispossessed is how we'll be judged. So when I listen to that guy, when I read what that guy said, I always feel a little bit better about my place on this planet. Josh, it's a tough question for me to answer. Uh, I'll probably lose listeners because of that. And it's funny to say that out loud, but it's absolutely true. I will have people who will no longer, they will probably get rid of me on Instagram, probably stop listening on YouTube because of my faith tradition. 
And that's just the reality of it, Josh. But thank you for asking. Ben, after eight weeks of once a week training, oh, busy schedule, and there's nothing wrong with that. I made good progress, but wanted to go back to even easier strength. I took your advice. Wait, what? You took my advice? On my previous question, I'm getting back on the deadlift in even easier strength. You said to experiment with deadlift variations. I find that a relatively narrow sumo mixed grip deadlift saves my back and elbow. Thanks for the tips. I am making progress with no pain now. Uh, listeners, listen. Instead of just saying, I can't, I can't deadlift, I can't back squat, I can't, I can't. He stepped back, thought it through, experimented a little bit, and did a reasonable and to me very doable approach to getting back in, and getting back into a program. Follow-up question. I want to get a comfortable double body weight deadlift. I'm 15 pounds off. I guess I could just lose weight. Uh, yeah, you know, Ben, that's actually the easiest, but we won't go there. Would you recommend the singles program from Easy Strength to do this or a more traditional squat and deadlift program? Um, you can either, you can certainly do it either way, but Ben, I'd even give you this idea. <laughs> that's the Dan John system. Don't deadlift. Increase your pushes, uh, uh, your prowlers. No, I was thinking car pushes. Your prowlers, your sled pulls. Maybe even get uh, some more squats in. And work on just getting your general work capacity up. Don't deadlift for a while and then go into the gym one week, you know, maybe three weeks, maybe six weeks, and don't go max. Don't go max the first time, but just see by not deadlifting if your deadlift improves. So if you're doing something like even easier strength, uh, try a vertical press, or, or it does, a, a press. I'm recommending the pull-up because you want that grip strength, okay? The ab wheel, and then every day do like a prowler and a sled pull or a prowler and a bear hug carry. So two loaded carries. So vertical, vertical press, any press, vertical pull, any pull, ab wheel, and those two. Give that about, you know, like I said, three weeks, and then come in and, just test your deadlift out and just get a sense of things. Here's the interesting thing. You might just pop your lifetime best right then. Um, as many people know, I never did deadlifts in my whole life. The first deadlift I ever attempted was when our gym record for 198 was 550 in the gym. And I asked Dick Notmeyer, I was just, I was about to blow through that weight class. Uh because my body weight was going up so fast. I was probably 197 and, you know, 29 thirtieths. And the gym record was 550. And I said, is that a lot, Dick? And Dick said, let's try out. Well, as I was getting ready to pull 555, he said, oh, and have your grip like this. And he showed me the standard deadlift grip. That's the first time I ever deadlifted. At Utah State, Bob Rillo bet me I couldn't pull 600. Now, the truth is, we didn't have two and a half, so I pulled 605 on the bet. He claims I didn't win because it was, he said six, I did 605. And the, the third time I lifted, Utah State University powerlifting team needed a 100 kilo lifter about three days before the meet. Uh, Jesse, the captain, said, Will you mind lifting on Saturday? So at 3 a.m. on Sunday morning, I asked the official, What's heavier than that guy just missed? It missed. And he goes, 628. And so I pulled 628 to be the last lifter at the meet. So the amount of deadlifting I've done in my life, well, after that, I did a lot more. But uh, you can get, I, I just can tell you, by Olympic lifting and running stairs, you can build yourself up to a 628 deadlift because it worked for me. It, your mileage may vary. But uh, try that, okay? Let's just see. Thank you, Ben. And if it's not clear... You ping me another note, and, we'll, and I'll type up something for you, okay? But just by the time that happens, you'll be halfway through the program, okay? Good luck. James asked a question that I swear I've answered before, but let's do it one more time. First question, do you have any thoughts on Pavel's latest book and program, The Quick and the Dead? I know you like to qualify your response to these types of questions with, it's not my program. James, that's an interesting 
one, two, three, four words you said. It's not my program. I don't see, I mean, I've done, I, if you go onto my website, danjohn.net or danjohnuniversity.com or just type in the words Dan John Coyote Point Kettlebell Club, you will find dozens, dozens of swing push-up programs. There, there's nothing new under the sun here. I, I mean, it's swings and push-ups. I, 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 it's great. It's the greatest program of all time. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's not my, but what he does is not my program. I can't comment on it. Uh, but after the thought, the program looked pretty interesting and maybe it could be the supplemented with some other strength work. You know, uh, I had a good conversation with somebody the other day and about how back in the early 2000s, uh, one of the things we liked about Pavel was the fact that he would, in a kettlebell workout, there'd be 15, 20 different movements and you would, you'd, there'd be windmills, there'd be uh, this exercise, uh, uh, well, there'd be cleans, there'd be snatches, there'd be swings, there'd be uh, press, there'd be deadlift, there'd be windmills, there'd be bent press, there'd be Turkish get-ups, there'd be, and these programs, uh, I remember seeing something Brett Jones gave to one of the people, uh, to one of the people on our, uh, the Dan John Q&A forum over at Dave Draper, and the guy put this program up and it was a combination kettlebell barbell program from Brett Jones. And the guy said, Dan, will you comment? Well, I go, yeah, it's great. You know, do it. And then of course he found fault in it. Of course, as we, you know, <laughs> without doing it, he found fault in it. But you know, all I can say is it's not my program. And I haven't, I, outside of people who are writing like blurbs, uh, I, if a book comes out on Monday, and you say it's the greatest program I've ever done on Tuesday. I, I think there's an ounce of um, disbelief I'm allowed to have that you could do a program in 24 hours and make that kind of decision. Uh, James, I'm not being a jerk. I'm just, it's like when people ask me about starting strength or all these other programs. The only program I ever feel I can really comment on is James uh, Jim Wendler's 531 because I had so much experience coaching it doing it. I taught my brother it. Uh, we used it a lot. Uh, I, I feel like I can really comment on 531. And mostly what I comment is, yeah, do that because it's a good program. Okay, we have a second question too from James. Since I'm asking about a new program, it signals an issue I have a lot. How do you deal with program hopping? Well, you're killing me here, James, because, okay, I'll answer. Usually by about Week eight of a 12-week program, I start searching for my next program. And I like, that's okay. And lose motivation for my current program. Isn't that interesting? So you get tired, about eight weeks is where you get done, okay? It's Because it's funny because you say 12, because I see 12-week programs all the time. I've done 16-week programs as written twice in my life. But I'm with you, James. Uh... I struggle after week two with the program. Uh, so I'm walking with you on this one. Uh, what I would maybe suggest is, you know, maybe you should start looking for six to eight week programs. Say, I like, I like six week programs because I think that's a doable finish. You'll notice many of my programs I, I give people are four weeks. The 10,000 swing challenge is four weeks. Uh, the transformation program works out to be about six weeks. The big 21 is three. Uh, the body is one piece. You can do for three months, but you have three weeks of deload de in there. Uh, and not a lot of hard training, but really it's for throwers and, and Olympic lifters. But I don't think there's, I don't think you're off by much here. I would, I would think, James, that probably the bulk of our listeners and our readership would be along with you. Um, getting over, yeah, eight weeks is right on the edge of what I think people can do. Um, you, you mentioned, I start searching for my next program. But I want to come back to that line because I think that's an important thing to do. When I'm working with athletes on a really tough program, like the Big 21 Olympic lifting program, when we're in week two, so we haven't even hit the hard days yet, I start talking about, now, after we finish this, we're going to have a week of, we're just going to do, you know, I don't, I don't know, arm work or, you know, arm work and hill sprints. And it's weird that they get excited about hill sprints in a program, 
But once they do the last three days, they're like, I can't wait to do hill sprints. Um, so I consciously start. So as the, as we get to here in a program, I start discussing what's next here so I can get them to finish the, end, the last week or two, as you're saying here, you, you'd have four more weeks. Mm. Is this a common problem with your athletes or is this? No, this is absolutely common. And you said here, or is it just something I need to get over myself? No, it is as common as anything in the world. Um, you know, when, when you look back on what mastery is, you know, mastery, part of mastery is that wonderful initial, we love learning curve. And then there's that plateau. And if you can hang in there long enough, you get to go up again. But most people, they love this. They hate the plateau. So you're, you're on the, you're in a, you're in a good place. Uh, if you get a chance to look up the name George Leonard, and look up the word mastery. If you can online, I think it's still available from Esquire, his article on mastery, or buy the book Mastery, which isn't as good as the article, I'll be honest with you. But uh, you'll learn a lot about what we're talking about right now. Falling in love with, the, like you're the same as me. I love those early weeks and then I hate it from there. Uh, it's a good question. Jordan asks a great question. Should I read Dune or the sword, in, the sword in the Stone first? Well, I, oh, by the way, Dune's coming out as a movie again, which amazes me because the first one was terrible. The sci-fi 22-part series was wonderful. We'll see if it works as a movie. Um, the thing about the sword in the stone, uh, You're going to have these wonderful one chapter reads. Uh, a lot. My favorite chapters used to be when I was young, the three chapter big arcing story. That'd be uh, meeting Robin Wood, and they have to go kill the Griffin and deal with the fairies. Uh, Master Twitey shows up in the Boar Hunt, three chapters. Uh, Mad Madam Mim, which is of course uh, a bit longer, early in the story, about three chapters, and then. Now I look back and I, well, and then I fell in love with the transformation, uh, transfiguration stories, becoming an owl, becoming a hawk, becoming a snake, you know, those stories. Now I'm in love with the transition stories. You can tell where I'm at as an adult, where they just simply have that quiet conversation between epic events. So you could easily read The Sword and the Stone, kind of like a Harry, Harry Potter's first book. Uh, Harry, the, the Sorcerer's Stone or the Philosopher's Stone, the first Harry Potter book, depending on where you live, um, you can read a chapter a night. Now, after that, they become much more uh, tapestry. But you can easily read The Sword and the Stone in a chapter a day or chapter at a time and really enjoy the story. With Dune, once you get into the deep part of the story where a lot's going on, it, it becomes a bit of a page turner. So I would say, why don't you pick up T.H. White's book first? Try Make sure you get an edition that's self-standing, Sword in the Stone. I do not recommend the Once in Future King's first book. Not Don't use, get the, the individual Sword in the Stone and read a, read a chapter a day. And then when you have some time to dig in Dune, go for it, okay? I think you'll like both. So my answer is um, Sword in the Stone followed by Dune, but you can also read them at the same time by doing the one chapter idea, okay? Gus asks a question. I think this is our first Gus. I have heard you mention several times that some of the best shot putters in the world did both the power and the Olympic lifts. The answer there would be all of the best shot putters in the world did both. In this approach, would you recommend for someone who eventually post-COVID-19 wants to compete in powerlifting. Well, I, I told the story earlier in the podcast about me competing as an Olympic lifter, uh, doing a powerlifting meet, and I had the best deadlift. There is great value in doing the quick lifts for the deadlift and probably the squat too. Uh, the bench would be the bench. But he has a follow-up question, folks, and this is important. Or would you just say to follow a plan like what Jim Wendler outlines? Well, Jim's a much better powerlifter than I, but... You, you ask a nice final question, uh, Gus. You say, or do you have other thoughts? 
Yeah, my other thought would be to train the way Marty Gallagher teaches us. Um, the When we worked together with uh, a, the special forces, he put together a manual. Now, not all of it's available, but in his book, uh, Strong Medicine, he outlines it very well. Uh, his idea is that, you know, you need to have absolutely gorgeous technique in the three lifts. And then you have to have a couple times a year a progressive, realistic 12-week training program. And then when that's over, you focus on quality of food and it's, I'm going to say cardio, but you have to understand it's like walking with weighted vests and heavy hands and things like that. Now, I, I, I don't think you can go wrong with uh, Jim Wendler. I don't, or, or Marty Gallagher. I think those would be much better resources than me. Um, if you t uh, Marty now has a, a blog called Raw, Raw, R-A-W, over at Iron Company. And of course, Jim Wendler has his own website. And uh, if you go through his list of PDF books, I guarantee you're going to find one of them that's going to be just perfect for you. Um Good luck, Gus. That's that's a good that's a good that's a fun series of questions. I appreciate it. Okay, we have a fairly long question from Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, I have an interesting result and a question for you today. Firstly, strange as it may sound, you have helped me kick an addiction to marijuana. Now, as I'm answering the question that today is 420, which actually is interesting to answer this question. I know they say it's not addictive. Uh, I'm just going to do you a favor here, Jeremiah. I think just about everything's addictive. Uh, watching people binge watch uh, Friends, watching 20 back-to-back -back episodes of Friends. I mean, you, that's got to be an addiction. Um, watching kids nowadays with their playing these games online. You don't think they're addicted? They are. I was addicted to this discus throwing. Uh, I know they say it's not addictive, but it was certainly a daily problem for me. For months, I'd been unable to kick the dang thing. I watched your workshop and use your goal-setting matrix. I'd always thought about the pain and pleasure of achieving my goal, but never the same for not achieving it. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, what? So you have to ask the question, gentle listener. I'm going to write this goal. What is the pleasure I'm going to get if I don't get my goal? I get to hang out with my friends. I get to smoke pot. I get to drink. I get to party. What you know? What is the pain of got not getting my goal? You know, uh, my friend Mike, my girlfriend will tell me. You know, my girlfriend will be right. My ex girlfriend will be right. Mm. You know, it's, it's it's helpful. Funny enough, it only took one good hard look at the pain of not quitting that finally ended me, enabled me to kick it once and for all. Many thanks for sharing this bit of insight. No, no, thank you, Jeremiah, for letting me know it worked. Um, you know, I give a lot of information. I don't get a lot of feedback. So thank you, Jeremiah. And you know what? I, I got a couple of friends who uh, work with helping people on the other side of some of these things. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention this when I see them next. Okay, thank you. Second, I have decided to hop on the 10,000 Swing Challenge. I hope you aren't sick of the topic by now. Hmm. You know, it's funny, of all the topics that I get sick of, the 10,000 swing is still okay. Uh, give me, it's it's the lunges and heavy Turk, Turkish get-up ones. I want to start hurting people. I know you not, might never be ready for the challenge, but I'm trying not to be stupid. I love that line. I'm trying not to be stupid. You're a rare error, Jeremiah. I was thinking of using the next six to eight weeks to work up to it with daily swing practice with a 24, but I'm not quite sure how to go about programming it. I've been using easy strength to make excellent progress in gobble squats, pull-ups, and presses. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Well, Jeremiah, the easiest thing would be to do is just do 75 to 125 swings a day and uh, just kind of change it. For example, you could do five sets of 15 uh, to warm up one day, uh, three sets of 25 the next day that those are both 75 uh you might want to do jump up to doing 10 sets of 15 one day try 15 sets of 10 another day um you know oddly 15 sets of 10 just 150 reps uh 
especially if in between you either shake yourself out or do mobility movement or even just, I mean, like sometimes when I do something like that, I clean up the garage. You know, it can be 15 sets of 10. So not one of the sets is hard-ish, but the way my body feels when I'm done, it's like, I feel like someone, you know, took a little uh, 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 and straightened me back up. My, my posture's better. I, you know, I feel looser. I feel smoother. Yeah, so try that. Um, gobble squat, pull-ups, press, swings. Um, toss in an occasional farmer walk. Or if you only have one, just do suitcase carries. Press, pull-up, gobble squat. Get those 75 to 150 swings in. Either do the ab wheel or a suitcase carry. Bye-bye. Try that five days a week for... And you're saying six to eight weeks. That's probably a little... That might be a little long. Um... You should be ready. You should be re ready much quicker than that. I, I don't know because I don't know your situation, but you should be ready to go uh, much earlier. And when you do your first, do me a favor too, on your first two, maybe even three 10,000 swing challenge days, just do the swings only um, and just kind of do a test day. Uh, get yourself up to the, that 500 number and just, you know, just see how it feels. The next day, maybe, or when I say the first day, so you do a set of 11, then you do no, you do nine more, getting to 20, do four more, 24, do 15 to 39, you know, that way. The next day, maybe try um, rounds of 15 or 20 or try that, you know, see where your grip, how your grip goes. Another day, do a test with just 10s, 50 sets of 10s. I would recommend getting a deck of cards, pulling the first two off, and just pull one off after every set. That's going to take a while, by the way, because every time you put the bell down and pick it up each time, just just try that the first three, and then maybe add, bring back the gobble squats, a press or so, uh, a, a pull up or so. All right. Good luck to you on this, and let me know how it goes. Chris asks a good question, kind of a personal question, and I like it. Have you had experience training people with autism spectrum, ASD, or ADHD? I'm not talking about trainees with exercise, ADD, shiny new thing, but legit learning disabilities. One of the things I'm real proud of, and you can find them over at danjohn.net, is the GetUp archives. Go in there, and I want you to type my good friend, my friend from Wilms Avenue in South San Francisco, across the street from South City High. And his name is Gregor, G Greg, G-R-E-G-O-R, Winslow, W-I-N-S-L-O-W. Greg has a son whom he trained. Now, the boy is very, it's, it's a wonderful article. Uh, if you just, if I think you can go online and type our two names in, and it will put you right to the PDF you need to be. But Greg took all the principles I use as training, you know, uh, performance sports and applied them to his son. Uh, I think we have two articles in there. And the reason I like those articles is it's a father working with his son. And it's beautiful, but it's also uh, uh, Greg's uh, insights as a as a uh, college intermediate hurler. Uh, it was in the Air Force. Uh, really impressive guy um, working with his son and using all of his street smarts and his experience to work with his son. That's the best. That's the best I can send you to. Now, having said that, Chris, one of the things I expect that every intern and assistant I work with do is adopt an underserved community. Uh, Taylor works with uh, people with cystic fibrosis. Mike Warren Brown specializes in aged performance, older athletes. And kind of think of it, that makes me sad because he trains with me every day. Oh, you know, there's a, there's a whole, uh, I work with people who are deaf, people with MS. Uh, you can, Lonnie works up in a, in a, in a kind of a, in an area where let's just say money is an issue. Um, we have a whole spectrum of people. People specialize in post-cancer, and I, I'm very proud of it. But, you know, it'd be nice if you could step up or, or others listening could step up and figure out some ways that we can train uh, these, these, these 
find people. Uh, um, that's the one thing I liked about that movie, The Accountant, where they went through how many mathematicians were, uh, I believe the word is spectrum. I, I'm out of my wheelhouse already. And it was kind of cool because it was like, you know, everybody, everyone on this planet has gifts to share. And, we, and I also believe that we can also attend to every person's physical shell uh, and, and, and make everybody, you know, healthier and more energetic and able to, to do great things. So if, if you have some ideas about how we can take this small little discussion and go forward with it, I'm all ears. Okay, my friend? Thank you. Lee, very simple question. If I use push-ups for my strength exercise during the 10,000 10, swing challenge, should I adjust the rep ranges to make them more effective? One, two, three, four seems pretty easy. Uh, for those of you listening, some of you who have done the 10,000 swing challenge might be hearing Lee and saying, uh, you probably haven't done it yet. Um, I don't, I used to do push-ups. I do presses now because like yourself, you know, I, I can press, you know, I can press a lot. But yeah, it is, on paper, it's easy. But, you know, you're, it's the 10, it's the swings that you're there for. Uh, the push-up day is easy. Pull-up day is very hard. The goblet squat, just, it kind of depends on your mileage. You can certainly pick anything you want to do uh, or not do uh, if you want to do the challenge, okay? Yeah. Thank you. John asked a question. Due to circumstances beyond my control with work and the fact that I contracted the coronavirus, I've been unable to lift regularly for almost a month. I'm sorry, John. Right before things changed at work, I deadlifted 305 for 10 reps. I was going to attempt a one rep max, aiming for double body weight, the week after this, but was unable due to current events. How do you recommend I ease back into heavy lifting? You know, I'm not sure high reps, and this is just this is the, just me talking, high rep deadlifts carry over to max deadlifts. I think high rep squats do. That's my experience with myself and with the athletes I've worked with, and the information from friends but in deadlifts uh i think back to the late great lane cannon who deadlifted 405 for 20 reps and then gave himself a couple weeks and failed with a 425 deadlift because since he was doing at the time it was called hit high intensity training is that you get really really good at kind of you know blowing blood vessels out of your eyes and you know, straining this and uh, getting, you know, you know, grinding your teeth down, but you don't actually get good at maxing. Um, generally, what I always tell people, uh, when, when you, when, John, when this is over, you get back into the weight room, you're going to find on day one that you're probably 80%. At most, you've, you've lost 20%. I mean, that would be at the most. Almost everybody comes back in and their pure strength levels are at 80 to 90% of where they left off. That's the great insight from my friend Glenn Passy, by the way, but that's, we'll talk about that another time. But what happens is your soreness level, uh, it's like you forgot, the delayed onset muscle soreness, it's like your body forgot what soreness was and they want to, re and you get so sore. So what you might find is that your first day back, you're going to be strong. And your reps are going to be kind of right there. But the next day and two days later, you're going to be far sorer than you have been in a long time. So what I'm going to kind of tell you is, you know, kind of allow yourself some glide the first couple of maybe a week or so. Do, do the movements. Don't be afraid to load things up, but stay as far away from failure as you can. Um, generally, I think you should keep a couple of reps in the tank. Maybe that first week or so, think, you know, uh, if you can do, if you can do ten with it, do five. Um, but it is going to be strange. A lot of people are going to discover this. You're going to be weirdly sore when you come back. Uh, of course, your mileage may vary, but that's kind of a truism for most people. I'm sure there's a hand going up right now. I did it and I didn't get sore. Yeah, and we all hate you. All right. So good luck to you, John and. Uh, yeah, and if you could give me some feedback if I was right or wrong on that, I'd appreciate it. And let's get that double body weight um, deadlift, okay? 
Simon asks a question. Simon says this. Can you please share your thoughts as to squat stance and to toe flare? Yeah, the way I teach squat stance is kind of funny. Simon, I have you jump, vertical jump. You land. I have you jump again. You look at me like this. You land. I have you jump again. You look at me and you go, what? And you look down and almost universally after the third jump, that's people's squat stance for that day. Uh, the heels will be basically underneath the hips. The toes will be out. Uh, the, the feet will be out a little bit. Uh, and it, it's weird to say that. Almost universally it works. Having said that, there's always idiots. Oh, teaching this at the RKC. Well, that didn't work for me. Okay, there's 120 people doing the drill. 120, 119 got it and one didn't. Oh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a jerk. But uh, that's, that's how I start. Now, it's going to move out and in over time in different the toes will, the, the angle of the feet and toes will change. But a lot of that is when you first start to squat, um, you know, the body changes. And you'll notice over time, as you get stronger and stronger and bigger and bigger, your squat stance does change. There are people born on this earth to squat deep. And I've been with people who can put their feet together and go their feet together and go rock bottom and hold an overhead squat with with weight on the bar. Well, that's I wasn't born to do that. So the other thing I just want to make sure you know, Simon, is that there is going to be some human individuality there. So just make sure you know that, okay? Well, that was a lot of questions. If you have questions, email them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Like I say, I'll do my best to answer all of them. Thank you so much.